Welcome to the Backstage Creative, the podcast that focuses on the people who work behind the scenes of theater. My name is Krista Copper. I am a bassist who is based in the Kansas City area. I've been doing this podcast for about two and a half years now, and it's been such a joy to sit down and talk to people who do some of the most overlooked and underappreciated jobs in the theater industry. It takes a lot of people to put up a live production. It takes a lot of creativity and love and passion and hard work and and sacrifice in order to uh, get a show up and going. No one person can do it alone, right? No one person has all of the skills needed to get a show together. It takes so many people to do it. And so that's what this podcast explores. It explores the different jobs that happen behind the scenes. And each week I interview people who who do those jobs and who have a lot of uh, wisdom and knowledge to share. Today is my conversation with Cherie B. Tay. Cherie is a stage manager and uh, they, they do a lot of other things, but um, I think uh, Cherie is mostly known as a stage manager. Sheree has a great YouTube video about uh, calling a show, which I have watched many times. It's been it's been such a nice reminder of a show, of being a part of a show, and what what it's like to hear a stage manager say five minutes to places, and it's kind of a, a funny idea for a YouTube video, but it has like eighty one thousand views now, so I think I'm not alone in in my appreciation for a reminder of a live production. Shri also does a lot of uh, voiceover acting. So we talk about that. We talk about working on Hades Town. Shri also just made the list of 50 women to watch the Broadway women's fund, 50 women to watch list for 2021. Uh, a lot of my guests actually c- come from that list. Um, I know a, a lot of guests last year I reached out to um, were from that list, and I'm sure this year will be no different. I'll be reaching out to many of the of the people who have made that list. I love initiatives like that. I hear it so often in the theater world, like, oh, we we can't hire someone of color or a woman because we don't know anyone, you know, all these excuses. But now there's organizations and groups putting out these really handy lists of people who are highly qualified and um, people who are ready to go. And I hope that um, these lists change the face of our industry. I hope that they provide more diversity in, in the workplace. Um, Yeah. So I'm excited. I'm excited for the, the possibility and the potential of, of um, things like Broadway black and, and the Broadway women's fund who are committed to showcasing the work of underrepresented artists in the theater world. Okay, let's go. Let's get to my conversation with Shri B. Tay. What have you been up to these past, or this past year, I guess, at this point? Oh my goodness, so much. I've been doing a lot of online stage managing. I've been doing a lot of tech consulting, surprisingly, where I help people with Zoom and with s- setups for their recording and whatnot. And then voiceover, a lot of voiceover, which is really cool. I love it. What else? Photography, videography I've done. I did like ukulele singing for <laughs> kids, um, volunteering. Um, yeah, a whole bunch of stuff. Um, I'd love to hear more about the like the virtual productions you've been a part of. How have those, how have those gone? Have they been, uh, you know, in your mind successful? Yeah, yeah. So I did theater for one with uh, Christine Jones. She is the artistic director of theater for one. She was also the Tony Award, Tony, the Tony Award winning designer um, for Harry Potter. She's an amazing human nice. in general. Um, so she had this concept back in the day where it was a box um, out on the street or whatever, and it would be one audience member and one actor. And then when they wanted to do it digitally, they had someone, uh, Mark, build a platform, like a an actual platform for it. And then we figured out a way to do kind of eye-to-eye contact so that the actors and the audience would get this feeling of connection of being eye to eye um so i helped set that up and set the actors up with that and 
it was really good it was really 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 good um that was a show i was very very proud of it was like all bipoc mostly women run uh it was it was great um has has there been anything unexpected when when you're trying to stage manage or something that you're like oh i didn't know i needed to know how to do that or oh this is a new (laughs) skill i need (laughs) definitely um i feel like there's a lot more of wrangling people in in terms of like just time zones first of all when you're rehearsing just in new york it's not something you have to worry about um And then getting everyone on the same page, I ended up building a website for the show that only they had the link to. So it was a central hub of information for everyone for their schedules, for any um, setups and links and all of the all of the information that they needed, even who's who or access to the scripts were all on one central site that was super easy to navigate. And that really saved us. That's a great idea just to build a website and dump all the information there so you don't have all these, you know, (laughs) 20,000 Google documents that everyone's trying to keep track of. Seriously. I mean, I highly recommend it. Google Sites, it's free. Very easy to do. Google Sites, like you can build a website now through Google? Of course you can. It's Google. (laughs) They're taking over the world. I mean, they have all of your information, but, you know, um, free website. (laughs) I didn't know you could do that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, when you're helping people with technology, I, it's interesting as I've talked to people, you know, interviewed them the past year, just hearing some people be very upfront with like, I know I hate computers or, you know, I hate, you know, using technology. And um, I think that's really common in the theater world because we love in person, you know, kind of, we just love, you know, the in-person experience. And so it's understandable why a lot of people in theater don't really like technology that much uh when you're helping people with technology maybe what are some of the common problems that you come across and what are some of the common solutions for people who are more technically challenged (laughs) (laughs) patience a lot of patience it's hard it's hard now that we're all online to get that same sense of connection once in a while you get it and when you do it's like really special to find someone you like click with even via online in terms of theater though and setting that up we had an an actor who was who didn't know what a finder was or how to get to dropbox so that just took extra time of like okay so you see this little smiley face with that's like blue and gray click that okay and then maybe getting um, while they're on Zoom to control their screen. So stuff like that of making it easy for them, knowing that I kind of joke that it was like those bomb diffusing robots where like someone's off on the side, like being like, okay, cut the blue wire. No, the blue wire. (laughs) Right. Like that. (laughs) That's kind of what it was. I'm like, don't click that. (laughs) Um, But we're all, we're all doing theater and we're all helping each other out. And it's a pandemic. So like a lot of patience, a lot of back channel, Ah, but you know, you keep it to yourself, you vent, and then you're done. You move on and you keep helping. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Mm -hmm. That's a good attitude to have. I'm excited to see how all of the skills that people have have learned through the pandemic, you know, using technology and and all the different tools available to us online, like how how that will impact once, once theaters open again. Do you have any like, do you have any like, like vision or thoughts on that? Ooh, that's such a good question. I don't know. I feel like we're going to need it. Well, depending on the vaccine of like, maybe there's a way to check in without everyone touching the same pen standing in the same spot, you know, stuff like that. I know people are working on virtual call boards. Same thing with the technology that's already being set up of like temperature checks. You know, when I went backstage at City Center with Being Arts Hero, they had like all of these temperature kiosks where you had to like sign in, scan a QR code. I was like, wow. So in terms of the theater theater of like the performance type, I don't know. I've been there's something so different between a Zoom play and being in the same space as others. And I don't think anything will ever replace that. However, I did do Nourish with um, the Women's Project and they were great. It was it was really nice to hold space with, with people in that room. So I don't know. 
I don't I don't have a vision for it yet, <laughs> but I'm excited for whatever is to come. Yeah, yeah. I I'll be glad to get back. I mean, of course, I'll be glad, you know, to get back into doing live <laughs> stuff, but uh, I'm excited to see the changes. I think there'll be a lot of, hopefully, hopefully, hopefully there'll be a lot of changes in the industry and I'm excited to see how some of those play out with technology and equality. And um, yeah, there's been a lot of good conversations happening during the pandemic. So it, it'll yes. be fun to get back and see how Absolutely. those conversations have impacted things. Yeah. Um, so I found out about you through a friend who shared your YouTube video of you calling <laughs> calls. <laughs> and I watched that many times because <laughs> it just made my heart happy <laughs> to hear someone tell me five minutes to places <laughs> and places. And I was just like, oh, someone telling me where to go, how long I have to get there. Just the easy life. <laughs> And I looked, I just looked at it right before we got on this call and it has like 80,000 views. So I'm not the only one who's missing, who needs, who needs that in their life. <laughs> for sure. That actually happened from Theater for One. So we, I was doing check-ins with the actors on Zoom and I said, all right, we're at places, everyone, places. And they're like, oh my God, we miss hearing calls. And I was like, me too. I miss giving calls. So then that night, I believe, like when we were done with the show, I just set up my camera and my mic and my backdrop and I just recorded this thing. And I didn't expect it to traverse the like travel the world i created something that people that my actors wanted and i i felt i needed and to see it spread around and see so many people resonate with it so many people who love this craft who's who who've had this passion taken away from them you know um it was really cool to see and see how much we all miss it mm hmm yeah. Mm -hmm. You have such a great YouTube channel, like all of your ukulele videos. And I was, I was like clicking around. I was like, oh man, these are awesome. Like all the, yeah, all the singing and the stage manager <laughs> stuff. Uh, do you enjoy like putting together YouTube videos? Is, is, is that something that you like to do? Is it, some, I mean, as, so I'm a musician and sometimes I feel like I have to do YouTube videos, right? Like you kind of have to have a YouTube presence. So it's not something I technically, I really enjoy that much <laughs> but <laughs> but is it something that you that you like doing talk, talk to me about your youtube channel because i really yeah. like it <laughs> <laughs> oh thanks i like it i i like making content i like making videos recently i've actually been making a lot of videos for younger me um mm -hmm. and like things that kids who were like me would need Music video wise, I was on tour with Warhorse and in the Heights, and I had a ukulele, and I thought, well, why don't I do a ukulele project? So, in almost, I think every week or every other week, I released a ukulele video while on tour with with uh, Warhorse. I think it went down to like once a month <laughs> the second year but that was really cool because we filmed in all of these different cities. Like I have one from Tokyo and Albuquerque and like all. Uh, Vegas like that was really cool so that was less of like I need to make a video so that I can get views and more of a like let's practice ukulele and like jam and collab with the actors on my tour so that was super fun it's almost like a scrapbook you know, like a modern day version of scrapbooking I, I know I've, I did that for a while too I would go outside I like to be outside a lot so I take my base outside <laughs> and and do videos Ooh. of places I was um you know, working at like summer stocks or just there for a month or so. And yeah, it was kind of like my, my version of scrapbooking of keeping track of, of the beautiful places I've been. Um, sure. But. Nice. Like you take your upright bass outside and play. Yeah. That's awesome. <laughs> weather, That's so cool. weather permitting, of course, because it's wood, <laughs> but. <laughs> nice. <laughs> yeah. I have a ukulele bass. I'm still learning. Cool. I'm, yeah. I'll be looking for videos with that. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I would love to hear how you got into stage management. I did click on your, you have like a playlist of common questions <laughs> that you get asked, which I think is such a great idea because when you're in the arts, people kind of ask you the same questions over and over. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I would love to hear how you got into stage management. Yeah. Um, I came to the U.S. when I was 13 and actually I think 12. 12. And then I've always been in love with theater. My parents took me to a bunch of sh touring shows when we were in Singapore. And so I always had the bug of like wanting to do something with theater. 
And so in ninth grade, someone asked if I wanted to pull curtains for the fall play. And I was like, I have no idea what that means, but sure. And then I just kind of stayed backstage the rest of my life. <laughs> um, so I went from pulling curtains to stage managing all of the shows, a bunch of shows, and then going to college for it, going on tour, becoming a music assistant, <laughs> and then stage managing again and on Broadway. What do you think about stage management drew you? Ooh, that's a good question. I love fixing and solving problem solving. I love problem solving. Like, give me anything and I'll be like, let me fix it. <laughs> it's like, it's a blessing and a curse, I would say, because <laughs> not all problems need to be fixed. But I really love the collaboration and working with others and and kind of this, we're all in it together. Let's make this happen, you know, which you don't really get in any other field of like this feeling of creating something beautiful that someone else gets to experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's so true. So true. Um, how did you get into music? Like ukulele playing. Do you play <laughs> other instruments too? <laughs> I do. I played piano when I was little and then I quit and then I played violin and then I quit. And then, <laughs> <laughs> and then um, in sixth grade, I think I took up or seventh grade, I took up the guitar for our schools, our Catholic schools guitar club where we played worship <laughs> songs in the morning. <laughs> I kind of played all through, like in high school, I was in all of the bands and all of the choirs, like literally every single choir in the band, the chamber, choir, chorale, chorus, whatever, um, to symphonic band, pit orchestra, marching band, jazz band, concert band, all of it. Doing that, I went to college and then I ended up also taking piano lessons, percussion lessons, drum lessons, uh, voice lessons, and just kind of like I, I music for me is just like theater is so therapeutic at times you know when when you just like have so much and you're just you just need to unwind some people watch movies sometimes I watch movies but sometimes I just pick up my ukulele and just start like playing and that for me is so nice of this outlet of like letting out my energy and voice and and anything I have to get out um, so so I was playing around with Finale and Sibelius, as you do in college, like a nerd. <laughs> <laughs> and I was doing the In the Heights tour, and Alex Lacamoire was like, hey, you're nice, you're smart, you do music, you know Finale well enough. I was like, yeah. He's like, let's go. And I was like, what? <laughs> and I'd never music assisted before. And it was great. It was so great. I learned so much from him. He is amazing and then from him I worked with Ron Melrose on a bunch of shows so yeah it was really cool yeah I've heard nothing but good things about Alex Lacamoire uh what it what do you do as a music assistant like what does that job entail <laughs> it depends from show to show and person to person um Lack had me doing a little bit more in-depth work of like oh hey measure 34 and 35 like this should be this and oh, that C should actually be in E or, you know, kind of do this. Oh, we have to change that. And then so more, a little bit more finale work, um, especially for rehearsals and band rehearsals and stuff. Whereas Ron, it was more like stage managing for the band and l a little less hands-on in the bars and in the music kind of work. If people don't know what it means, it's like you assist the person who's doing the music, either the orchestrator or the music supervisor. They have you do a bunch of stuff, like mostly like, oh, um, this piece, have you printed it out for the band? Have you printed it out for the, the actors? Who needs it? Has it changed in the script? Uh, which band parts have been done? Blah, blah, blah. And kind of just like he, being the stage manager of the music department. <laughs> I was just thinking they're basically the stage manager of, yeah, music. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I haven't interviewed a lot of stage managers, managers who come from like a music background. A lot of them, it seems like they try acting and realize they don't like it, but they still want to be involved in theater. So they, you know, hop backstage. But yeah, I'm sure that's really helpful, especially, especially obviously when you're working on musicals to have that music language to be able to communicate with people and um, communicate with the band and, and music director, because sometimes it's a little 
it's different. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of stage managers don't read music and they get along. They get they like are amazing. Um, for Hades Town, Beverly definitely once in a while would call me out to the house and be like, Come here, make my counts, do my counts story. I'm like, All right, cool. So that was really fun. I really enjoyed that. Mm-hmm. I love that Hades Town music. Oh my goodness. <laughs> so, so good. good. So good. Do you have any favorite memories from working on Hades Town pre? covid because it will come back hopefully <laughs> but pre-covid any any favorite memories from working on Hades Town? so many that show was just such a delight to work on all of it from like saying hello to everybody getting our nugget ice from the good ice machine saying hello to all the front of ha- like dollar friday i get to go around and say hello to everyone i miss that i miss just like getting the ride the lift during pre-show right yeah Mostly missing missing the community, I would say, more than mm-hmm. anything. And calling a show. God, I miss calling a show. <laughs> what do you like about calling a show? Like, as a musician, I don't have that desire. <laughs> what do you like about <laughs> calling a show? Like, what, what's the attraction of calling a show? <laughs> it's like all of these separate departments, right? You have, God, so many departments. You have the lights sound or audio um fly automation wardrobe the music department like all all of the departments coming together deck props and you are kind of like the air traffic controller of making things happen when they need to so it's like you're given this palette of paints and you're the one like creating that photo so that when that button hits that piece has landed and the lights snap on at that time so you create this like environment that the audience feels when it when you nail it like you feel it and the audience feels it so like there's a cue at the end of Hades Town where I watch Reeve intensely and I try and nail that so that when he does something no spoilers um the lights come up That excites me so much of like staring at him, feeling his breath. And then when he does it, I'm like, go. And then when the audience goes nuts, I'm like, yeah, (laughs) it's it's there's really no other job. Like like I can't be like accounting and be like my formula worked out, you know, like, (laughs) yeah. Do you ever get nervous or like second guess yourself because sometimes you're like there's safety issues involved right and if you call it wrong someone could get seriously injured (laughs) I do you ever get like nervous or like I mean is that probably with experience you stop second guessing yourself but yeah yeah, how do you handle kind of the pressure of if you call something wrong something someone could get hurt or you know a moment is ruined (laughs) a lot of times you work with pros and also you work with people who who want to make the show look good as well. So I trust the people that I work with, um, and I know that they have my back. So once in a while, like I was, we were doing the dance break at Hades Town, and I somehow missed a cue because it's literally like 18 counts of four. <laughs> and I'm chatting with someone because something was happening. And so I just missed a cue, and our Pat, our um, light board operator, just like, he was like, hey, I took that for you so that the button wasn't not a button. And I was like, cool, thanks, man. So I know that they have the show's best interest in mind as well. And so trusting that um, and trusting that if something does go wrong, that none of us are going to be like screaming at each other and and blame each, each other and none of that. It's It's a collaboration, which I really enjoy. And it's nice to have because sometimes you don't have that. Um, the crew that we have at Hades Town is unreal. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You have to remember that we're all human. I have to remind myself of that sometimes when I'm like in the pit with other people, like, okay, we're human. We're all human. We're like, <laughs> it's okay. It's fine. It doesn't need to be perfect. It's live. Yeah. It's fine. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Does it ever get like taxing to to be dealing with people all of the time and, and navigating <laughs> personalities and navigating different, you know, language, but, you know, the sound engineer uses different language than the lighting designer. And does it ever kind of just get kind of wear you down to 
always be the one that people come to with problems and always be the one that has to handle, you know, the difficult situations. There definitely have been days that are harder than others. I, If I didn't love this, I don't think I would be doing it. I'm such a nerd. Like, <laughs> I programmed light boards before. Like, I obviously love my audio equipment. So stuff like that of of having the lingo and also asking them about it, right? Like, going up to our auto deck person, Spencer, and I'm like, hey, show me what you do. Like, teach me how this, how you do your checks. Like, oh, okay, so then you hit reset on this. Okay, so then how do you turn the, the turntable clockwise, anti-clockwise in a not like, it's because I want to know in case you fuck up, but like a genuine interest of like, this is cool. Like, this is how it's done. So then you also have that language and that connection of like, oh, like, that's great. Like, I know what you're doing. This is cool. Like, I, yeah, just complete trust and also that ability to communicate. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There's always something to learn. Always, always something exactly. to learn. Exactly. Yes. I always say that. Like, keep learning. You're never going to stop learning. You're going to learn how to how to climb stairs when you're 50 with arthritis. Like, it, you literally never stop learning. Mm-hmm. Um, besides, you know, taking the initiative to go talk to people who are working on shows, is there any other way that you um, learn or get better at what you do? Like, any other, like, like a physical resource or... Any other uh, like routines in your life that help you learn and grow? I think as well-rounded as you can be uh, will help you where you're not just all I do is theater and stage manage and that's it. Because we all have lives outside. I mean, as as hard as it is to believe, we all have lives outside of theater, right? Uh, whenever I interview someone, I always ask, so what are your other interests and hobbies? Because um, I want to know that that you have something else in life that fulfills you. Not to say that if you don't, you know, like you do you, that's cool. Like if I like you, I like you, whatever. <laughs> um, not judging anyone. Uh, but as much as you can learn, like learning a new instrument or learning a new trade or just keep learning, keep, keep cramming information in, in a good way that you enjoy that is healthy. I have so many caveats of like, don't come after me. Of <laughs> <laughs> yeah. like, do what makes you happy, keep learning, and uh, enjoy it. Mm -hmm. In terms of resources for stage managers, there's Year of the Stage Manager on Facebook and Instagram and TikTok. Um, they do a bunch of events and Q and A's. There are a bunch of books as well out there that you can find via Year of the Stage Manager. There, there are so many resources out there. Definitely join that group. If you're listening to this podcast, you're doing great because you're doing the research. So, yeah. Yeah, as frustrated as I've been with Facebook lately, I'm, as I'm sure we can all, most of us can, if not all of us can relate to, like the groups, I think, are what have kind of kept me from deleting my account. It just, you know, the information that I get from um, Pit Base Roundtable and USITT and I think those those groups are just so invaluable for growing and seeing what people are talking about. And, you know, that's how I found out about other theater podcasts and, you know, cool YouTube videos about stage managers calling shows. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, yeah, there's there's resources out there. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. So what other uh, interests and hobbies do you have? <laughs> Ooh, um, my ukulele. I have my keyboard back here. I don't know if you can see. Mm-hmm voiceovers have been so amazing during the shutdown and I'm loving it. It's It's been a whole new community of people um, who are so supportive and it's great. I get to use my voice, which I miss using. <laughs> like I'm like, I talk into a microphone every day at work. So here I am talking to a microphone every day again. I shot a band. I shot a musician. I did a COVID wedding. <laughs> Um, and then some videography work of like helping people with self tapes or the actually the Fates Hades Town Fates Christmas album. I shot some B roll for them, so oh, that cool. was super cool. Yeah. <laughs> so doing stuff like that and video games. One day I'll get an Oculus. If anybody listening to this wants to send me an Oculus too, <laughs> give you <me> my address. <laughs> um, talk, what's what's voiceover world? 
like, I don't know. I don't know anything about it. So anything you could, <laughs> um, but like, what is, what do you do for voiceover? Well, when I first started, I was super lost and I was like, I don't know, like Andre and Amber were like, you should do voiceovers. And I was like, I know, I don't, I don't know how. And so Kimberly Marable is one of our workers, Persephone understudy. And she was like, oh, I did this thing at Edge and this is what I did with this. And these are my agents and go get yourself some equipment. And I was like, cool. SAG also has a voiceover lab. So I joined that. So in, it's, it was like learning a new trade in terms of getting into this field of, okay, so I did this like investigate voiceover and then they want me to pay $4,000 for a demo. And I was like, no. So then buying the equipment, learning how to use the equipment, what kind of recording uh, um, DAW are you using? Like your digital audio workspace. Like I use Adobe Audition. I'm sure you use what do you use? Audacity? Audacity, yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, learning how to use that, an interface, a mic, like building a, a sound-treated studio. There's just so much that goes into it. And then what, right? You get a demo. Do you reach out to agents? Do you do pay-to-plays? Do you uh, Learning how to do contract negotiations. Like there's so much. And like marketing yourself and, and doing the grind and meeting people. It's nonstop and people think that it's just you go up to a mic and you're like, buy this orange juice. It's the best. <laughs> like that's that's first of all, ter a terrible read. There's so much more to it than just going up to a mic and being like today on NBC. Like it's just, it's just like there's the people that was also a terrible read. But you get what I'm saying, right? It's not mm -hmm. just going up to a mic and saying things. It's there's so much more to it. And I didn't. No, but thankfully I had a lot of mentors just like theater who took me under their wing and really have been so kind and so giving with their time and knowledge. And it's been absolutely amazing. What's maybe one of the biggest things you've learned um, since getting into um, voiceovers? Ooh, that I love it. No, um, <laughs> I mean, I do. That being an actor is as scary as I thought it would be. <laughs> yeah. I I did a a thing at 54 below or I did something. No, not 54 below. One of the cabarets, like a Broadway cabaret with a bunch of our Haiti sound cast members and I sang my ukulele. I brought my ukulele to sing and I was so fucking nervous. And Amber's like, welcome to my world. Like, welcome to our world. And I was like, you guys get nervous? I was like, I feel like I'm going to shit myself before I go up on stage. She's like, yeah, this is what we feel. And I was like, seriously? <laughs> like, how do you do this? <laughs> so really getting that firsthand feeling of like, okay, psyching yourself up to be like, you can do this. You're all right. Trust in yourself. Mm-hmm. How do you like summon up that courage to to like walk out on stage to, you know, hit record? How do you what strategies do you use to find that courage? It varies day to day. I had a really, really tough week two weeks ago and I have a support group actually um, just for voiceover. I call it my cheer team. We call it our cheer team um, where we kind of cheer each other on. And then I have fantastic coaches and and mentors and, and now friends um who I trust and who I uh, appreciate the advice of who know the industry so well that uh, I, you know at the end of the day it's still you your decision whatever it comes down to but in terms of finding that courage and you can do it is that it's you like Andre Shield says this all the time there's only one you you were the only you. No one else has the same life and experiences that you do. You were the only you out there. And in voiceover, a lot of times that's what they want. They want you. They don't want you to sound like anyone else. They want what you bring to the table. And so knowing that um, really helps. Mm -hmm. Is there a lot of crossover between like people who work in theater and also work in voiceover or is it pretty I mean I've heard of some actors who have gotten into doing like voice over stuff like that but I mean is there, are there you know people a lot of people that work in both industries yeah 
There are. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Surprisingly more than you think. Or Faye has been doing voiceover for like a long ass time. I know Kimberly does it. Joelle does it. I'm sure Andre has done a bunch. Um, Pippa Sue just did that movie, Over the Moon. A bunch of, of theater people for sure. Mm-hmm. Lynn. Look at Lynn doing Moana. Like <laughs> <laughs> bringing in all his theater friends. Mm-hmm. You've rubbed shoulders with a lot of really uh, you know, like just impactful people in the theater world. Um, just some of those names you're naming. I'm like, wait, wait, are they talking about? Yep, they are. Okay. <laughs> that one. Yep. <laughs> the, yeah. the Lynn, the Andre. <laughs> um, is there any, do you notice any commonalities between all of these, you know, Tony winners, you know, uber successful league of their own people? Are there any, are there any common commonalities that you notice between them that's a good question i don't know because i think the the biggest thing i've learned is that we're all human we all have insecurities we all have flaws we all have our own traumas and our own stories of love and rejection and whatnot right we're all human at the end of the day sure some have more resources and accolades and and quote unquote fame but what is fame really right Knowing that of like, hey, they're just people trying to get by on their day um, really helps. I actually was super nervous when I first worked with Kevin Bacon and I was like, he's like a star. Like, I don't know. And then I was like, all right, cool. And then I worked with Vanessa Hudgens and I was like a hot mess because I was like, she's like really famous and like. Like, we're cool. Like, I'm totally, like, helping her backstage and, like, solving problems. But I still feel really weird about it. I'm like, okay, calm the fuck down. <laughs> and then after working with her, I was like, all right, well, fuck it. Like, everyone's just just human. Uh, it, took, it definitely took a while to be like, calm your, calm your jets. Yeah, I don't know. For some reason, that was because she's, like, my age. I don't know. I was doing the Council Fashion Design Awards. So working with, like, Tina Fey and Amy Poehler and, like... <laughs> All of these, Kristen Chenoweth, Hugh Jackman, like I've, I've been there, I've seen it. It's it's at this point, people you work with. So like Michelle Obama and Hillary Clinton came backstage and that was cool. Like we all were just like, awesome. <laughs> yeah. Steven Spielberg came backstage. Like, ah, it's, it's <laughs> unreal. Unreal. Still cool. But at the same time, there's just people. Mm hmm stars they're just like us <laughs> yeah right <laughs> da, da, da. <laughs> yeah that's a good point i yeah i remember i did a master class with some famous bass player which i mean being a famous bass player that's kind of a joke but famous so relative yeah yeah it, but I, I was doing a master class and i was playing and i was super nervous because this person's like my idol you know i've listened to all his albums and he's and, the, and one of my classmates was like, Krista, he's just a person. And I was like, you're right. I just need to calm down. But he's, but he's like, no, like you're just, he's just another person who plays bass. He plays bass better than you, but he just, <laughs> he's just another musician. And I think that's, yeah, that's important. Like we're all, no one's, a, no one's above someone else or yeah. Yeah, yeah exactly. Exactly. Mm-hmm. We all are wondering what we're going to have for dinner. Like we're trying to like feed our dogs. Like, you know, we all have things that we do. We've all had our work canceled by the pandemic. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> wah, wah. Yeah. <laughs> um, I have one final question I'd like to ask people, but did we, is there anything else that you would like to touch on that we didn't get to? Not that I can think of. Oh, I made the uh, Broadway women's list of list of women to watch this morning so that was cool are they releasing another one they did one for this year yeah oh, okay i saw the one from 2019 yeah i didn't yeah. know i'll have to look for that new one Congrat- congratulations that's awesome thanks <laughs> yeah I, I was like all right cool <laughs> your life will be changed forever now everything yeah. will change for you <laughs> i'm ready i'm ready for my tony yeah ready for your stage no. manager tony <laughs> uh, <laughs> Awesome. Well, that's that's great and well deserved. So, congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my final question I like to ask everyone is advice to young people. So, what advice would you give to young stage managers who are just starting out and who want to make a living as a stage manager? Yeah. Um, keep learning 
and and make sure that this is something you really want to do because you got to love it above anything else that you're doing or else it's going to be terrible. <laughs> um, the first thing I heard when, when I was shadowing someone, I was like, I want to be a stage manager, like little me. And they're like, run. <laughs> like, Aw. But you really, really, really have to, at the core of yourself, love this job. Keep learning. Just don't ever think that there's no such thing as perfect ever. Um, you have to keep learning, keep improving, keep making mistakes and learning from them, essentially. And that feeling of not being good enough will sometimes never go away. Mm. And by that, I, I don't mean that it's constant. I just mean that even people who have worked on Broadway for decades still have days or even like a, a short period, maybe not days, but like at a, a point where they're like, wow, I suck. Um, so knowing that you're not alone and feeling that. Um, and then the last thing is get in any way that you can and stay in. And you do that by doing the job you were hired to do and be good at it and be nice. And people will notice. The music for the Backstage Creative was improvised and performed by Ian Leroy and the logo was designed by Carly Wagner.